Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Indica Books uh, Writers Open House with Otis. And uh, for and as this is uh, in a long time, we're seeing a lot of new faces. So I'll take a little longer to do the introductions and and the ground rules uh, for those who are joining for the first time or after a long time. So this is an initiative by Indica or Indica Academy, as it used to be called. And uh, this is run by Indica Books uh, with me as your host and with Otis as our, as our guest faculty. And the intent is to, to use this as a platform to help aspiring writers develop their craft, get feedback on their writing, and in general also get, a, get to see and hear feedback on other people's writings that are submitted. So how does this work? We invite you to send short writing pieces that you want feedback on, and those pieces can be 750 to 800 words. So please don't send, uh, you know, 25 page long pieces. Uh, the intent is not to do a full fledged, uh, uh, you know, development editing or any kind of that process, but to take 750, 800 words, uh, put them in a Word document, put a title, put your name, email it, address, and other things, and uh, Make it easy for Otis to mark up his feedback. So put it in Times New Roman font size 12, double spaced, and then send it as a PDF. This is important. Send this as a PDF uh, to Otis, and he does two things after that. The first one is he will let go over your piece and put in, put in some of his comments inside the PDF document as markup, and he will send it back to you. The second thing that happens, which is now on Sundays, is he will pick up those pieces that he has reviewed and go over them one by one. So he will look at each piece in turn and talk about it, uh, uh, give us feedback, talk also in, in, in more general ways about some of the principles of good writing. How do you, uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, point of view or how do you, uh, you know, what, what does the narrative art look like or character versus uh, plot and all of those wonderful things that we recognize implicitly when we read good writing pieces by, you know, by, by accomplished authors, but we may not always have a good sense of how to go about it or put our finger uh, precisely on what those things, attributes of good writing are. So we have, and okay, before I uh, hand this over to Otis, one last uh, piece is that uh, uh, do send in your piece by Friday at the latest. If you send it by Friday, then uh, if Otis doesn't have a whole lot of pieces already to, to work on, then he will take them up, review them, send them uh, your back your, uh, his feedback. And on the following Sunday, uh, go over those pieces. If you send it late, by all means, you're free to do so, but... Uh, those will then be picked up only the next Sunday for discussion. So with that, you can, okay, one more, uh, well, okay, I forgot one more thing. We also have a WhatsApp group. I will send, I will share a link to that WhatsApp group on the Zoom chat in just a second. So if those of you who are interested, you can use that link to join the group. Uh, it is strictly, completely optional. So if you already are suffering from WhatsApp overload, then, uh, you know, feel free to ignore that. And we do put up these uh, recordings up on YouTube a couple of days after the session. And we have had uh, 35 such recordings since we began in August of last year. And uh, I think I'm done talking. I will hand this over to you, Otis, and the floor is all yours. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, I, uh, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, my, my bad. I forgot one last thing. So when your piece comes up for discussion, please do share your webcam so we can see, uh, you know, it makes it for a more personal engagement. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, uh, please also take a minute or two or less, whatever you're comfortable with, to introduce yourselves. I'm really, really done talking now, Otis. <laughs> and what else? Okay. Um, the... Uh, um... Abhinav, can you enable my screen sharing? Okay, thanks. Okay, um, 
Great. Well, we'll we're gonna we'll just uh, jump right in. I got a number of pieces. Um, I don't know, Abhinav, you said <laughs> I was I was looking for other things because I was looking at Ram's piece, and um, and uh, Ram was in another thing with me. And, uh, one of the things I, as you were talking about, sort of like you know the 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 font and little things like that in terms of formatting, I actually really want to encourage everyone to um so here i have i i was just looking for an example but i have the norton anthology of short fiction so uh, this honestly if, if you want to be a writer and and most writers do in the u.s right now most writers are really starting with short stories just because they're I mean, I guess there are writers now that are, you know, working into this kind of fan fiction. So they're working on longer pieces that sort of work within worlds that are already created. The short story is a pretty good form to start with. I, I guess it doesn't really matter where you start. But anyway, you should, everyone should read probably <laughs> every story in the Norton Anthology of short fiction. Um, they, they're not all illustrative of what you should do because they exist in a kind of historical context. So you have to understand them in a historical context. You're not gonna to wanna to write a story, you know, a modern story now that sounds like, or uses you know, the sort of language structures of a 19th century story. You know, that's, and, and in the same way, you're actually, if you take someone like, I mean, there are a number of readers and it occurs to me that Maybe at some point we should make a list of, you know, like the must reads um, in the short story. You know, we can make a number of lists that I think are probably important. Um, but at the same time, like you shouldn't write a short story that sounds like a 19th century story, but you also can't really write a story that sounds like Raymond Carver. Um, in the in the US, Raymond Carver was a huge uh, short story writer in probably the 80s um 70s and 80s and there are a number of writers like this Hemingway is like this you can't write in the style of Hemingway but you should understand what Hemingway is doing you can't write in the style of Carver because it's so well known people just think that you're imitative but you should read all these things but the thing that I'm bringing up Rom is that I want to show the format here and I, I want everyone to figure out, and I have to do it too. My automatic formats are like yours that I'm sharing. Um, the new the new modern sort of default is this uh, kind of, what is, what is it? You're like a business letter style, Ram? Yeah, it is. So I've been like, you know, I used to work with an uh, American consulting firm and we had a standard uh, uh, writing template. So uh, the chain, so where there was no paragraph intent, indent. So I'm now used to not writing with paragraph intent, indent. No, I so know. I, think, I, I know it's actually uh, changed on me too. I I'm using, I'm using my program when I, when I'm trying to write up a note, I cannot get the standard, you know, this standard space formatting, intent. Yeah. which I've, you know, I've grown up with, yeah. but anyway, the, the, the reason for it, I know it's so boring. I know this is mm. so boring, but, um, but you know, Ram, that I, that I encourage, like we yeah. need help yeah. when we write writing is complicated. So if we sure. can do things that help us with our formatting that make things clear, they make things clearer for us to start with. And mm. then it also makes things clear for the reader. It's just like grammar or anything else. Of course. It's like we have this common this common uh, symbology basically that includes mm -hmm. format mm -hmm. and so so yeah i i have the same problem i have to figure out how to make my computer program right in the traditional style but the reason why it works is that we want to indent all the paragraphs mm -hmm. but the other thing you get to do is you you, you get to take away this space and what that mm -hmm. means actually is you get to use that space for some other things because if you look at the stories in Norton Anthology, there are some places where there are spaces. So that you'll have a group of paragraphs and then a space. And the way I use a space, mm -hmm. I use a space when I change time or location. Okay, understood. Okay, when got I, it. When, when, I have a, when I have a change in space time, I use a space. And now when I, so when I read and I see a space, 
Mm -hmm. you know, well, let's start, let's start with, you know, when I use it, like when I use it, I'm organizing the fact that I'm in this space, I'm in this scene and, and in, in its way, it's very much like script writing, mm -hmm. right? I'm using something from script writing. Script writing would never have two locations combined. It in a scene. Yeah. It wouldn't. Never. Yeah. Yeah, because they got to shoot the film somewhere else, you know, yeah, I agree. same thing for us. Same it is like writing a play. Us. It's like writing a play. I can't have two different locations in one scene. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you mm. take away that Correct. ability. I mean, yeah. it's, it's kind of simple, but I realized looking at yours, you, you take away the ability to use that simple tool when you mm. have a space between every paragraph. Yeah. So we got to get rid of that. Got it. Uh, Amanaf, yes. Question? So can you also use space to to denote a change in point of view, or that's I a strict no-no. Yeah, because that's it. Okay, so I'm going to say something that I think is fascinating for everybody. <laughs> when you change point of view, that's a change of location. Right, yeah, right. That's right. I mean, if I was doing it, so so I'll go back to John Gardner is a writer in the US. Uh, he taught at SUNY Binghamton. I was at SUNY Binghamton. I could have taken a course with him, but I was an idiot when I was in college, so I didn't. Anyway, he wrote a great book called Grendel. Grendel was from the point of view of the monster in Beowulf. Amazing book. And in that uh, book, Grendel says, Grendel's looking out over the step, or the son of Grendel, I forget. There's Grendel and the son of Grendel. But I think the son of Grendel at this point is looking out over the step and says, oh no, the pattern makers. Take that to heart. The pattern makers. That's us. We're the pattern makers. So, Abhinav, the real answer is you create the pattern and then use it. So you could you could change points of view. I mean, if you're changing points of view, you are changing locations. It's a rather major shift for the reader. You could have a situation where you have one paragraph in one point of view, one paragraph in another, and go back and forth. Um, that's kind of like, I mean, that would be jerking the reader around to, for my point of view. Um, but you could do it. And if the reader got used to it, if it works, it works is the answer, right? If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I happen to be particularly sensitive to point of view because I pay attention to it. It leads my work, basically. Other people would do chapter to chapter. But, but I want you to see that there's no strict answer. It's you coming up with a pattern that then the reader follows. The same thing happened, as you know, in, you know, the, the Indian epics, right? In the Greek epics, in poetry, in everything, they develop patterns. Patterns become the thing that you use. Diverging from the pattern then also becomes something you use, right? Like in a sonnet, you have iambic pentameter, but then you have one line without an iambic pentameter, and it strikes the reader differently more profoundly because you've changed the pattern. So go to patterns, but I would, you know, obviously every writer wants to engage in their own uh, originality. It doesn't, you don't want to do that strictly. It doesn't work that way because the, the writing is finally a relationship between writer and reader. So I would I would use some established things. And as Ram knows, I, I do say, you know, use our tools, which is creating that space, you know, that indentation, those spaces, whatever you're using, use those tools, particularly when you're drafting, you know, I mean, why not use them to help you organize what you're writing. And then if you want to jam it all together into one thing at the end to confuse your reader, well, that's up to you. Then that's your choice. Right? Right. Yeah, I'll keep it in mind. Yeah. I'll set up a template okay. for myself. Keep, I'll set up a template for myself. Mind. Keep it in mind, Ram. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, hey, tell us a little bit about this piece. Okay. So uh, this is a short story that I wrote uh, a while ago, almost an year ago. And uh, in some sense, this comes from a personal experience uh, where I used to be a paying guest uh, with a very old lady, a septuagenarian, uh, a childless widow when I first moved to Bombay many years back. And uh, this is a little bit about her. So she was very different. She was very, very spirited, extremely spirited. And uh, it was it was an experience uh, that remained with me. So this is just the first part of that story that I have shared. So the story goes to about some 4,000 words. Okay. Um, 
Well, I I have to say I was I was really drawn into this first sentence. So Dapanwala shook his head. Of course, I'm going to cut sympathetically. Right. I would I would I would cut the tut tutting right because mm -hmm. I'm already he's shaking his head. I'm already getting it. Mm -hmm. um, what a The Panwala yeah. shook his head. Shook his head. Mad woman, he said, handing the pack of gold flake kings and added, you know, etc. I, lo I love this first sentence. It's a little bit complicated, but I like the use of some language that I'm not familiar with, but I feel like I understand. I like that I totally understand the relationship that's taking place. It really drew me in. Thank you. Ram, we've been doing uh, this work for a while. What do you... Where do you think the work needs to be done on this piece? Actually, this I, I wrote this before I started uh, uh, doing the work with you. So uh, this piece needs work at a lot of uh, places. Uh, one is in terms of the uh, uh, point of view. I think the point of view shifts a little bit back and forth. Uh, the second thing that happens is that uh, there is a little bit of going back and forth in time. So there is a particular scene, then there is a backstory, then it comes to the present, then it goes a little back again, and then it comes back to the present. So through the story, there is a little bit of that going back and forth. Uh, so that is something that uh, needs work. The third thing that needs work is I think there is, uh, there is more tell uh, than I would want there to be. Uh, uh, throughout the story i think there can be more dialogue more action beats uh i mean like when i look at the first page i know that there are at least three places where i can replace the exposition with uh, some amount of either action or dialogue or something like that okay um yeah that's a that's a good analysis i um i you know as you're talking i see that you know we can we can sort of be pretty reductive about it too because mm. i you know, I'm perceiving that, you know, when you write that there's there's too much exposition, that's also, you know, it, it tells me something, right? Mm -hmm. You you obviously want to be writing something, but the question is, what are you going to be writing? When you write exposition, mm -hmm. you're not writing this other thing. You're not you're not writing the character action. That's right. And that's actually the big thing that I see here is that this story is not driven by character action. It's not mm. driven by your protagonist action. Yeah. That's really the central thing that we're trying to develop. So, I mean, what happens in a sense, I mean, and there's a number of things that are finally informing me about this, but so when I start here with the Panwala, that's my present story. That's, that's the story right. you, you have, basically every writer, we have one opportunity to say where the story is. And it's that first sentence. And we're either going to get that reader on that first sentence and have them commit to our story or we're not. We have little control of whether they open their book or not, but we have mm. control over what happens once they read that first sentence, which is to grab them by the throat and not let them go. Right. So I'm in the present story and I've been told by you, you've created a contract. Mm. Basically, your contract is. I, I'm coming in, I'm saying my, my part of the contract is I'm looking for a story and your part of the contract is I'm providing a story and here it right. is. And you start. Your first sentence did that. But what follows didn't. Mm, that's basically, right. yeah. like I was I was there with you in the first sentence. You had me, you had me, <laughs> you know, and and what you did was you then lost me. Yeah, because yeah because you did not you didn't establish the conflict i mm. because i think the conflict is going to be right here the, there's no time like the present sorry i can't write with my mouse yeah. conflict yeah. right right uh i think that this is the con there's some conflict here there I basically is, yeah, think, right. you know it's it's happening The mm. two things you need, the two things you need to do right away from my point of view. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, do everything else you want to. I'm just giving you my advice. Right. Everyone can do what they want, obviously. So, but my two, in the beginning, you establish a conflict and you establish why I care. Mm. Why I care is the universal element, right? It's the internal struggle of the character that, that is a universal element. That is a right. struggle that I have too. So that, okay, that's really, it's really important that it be that it's not a personal struggle because if it's mm -hmm. a personal struggle, it's like, why do I care if this guy has a good time where he lives or not? I don't care. 
the point is if it's universal then i see myself reflected in this character i feel that i will accomplish and learn something that will contribute to my own survival if i pay attention to this person's struggle as they try to negotiate their circumstance mm, right those two one two and that is basically the beginning of your story plus there's another part of it there's really maybe it's three things in the beginning um conflict why i care the universal internal struggle and then the commitment to action of some kind i mean i think it's interesting ram if you think about it this way uh -huh. you know if you if you don't commit so you basically have to figure out what is the character going to do about their problem what are they going yeah. to do are they going to flee are they going to try and shape the circumstance are they going to are they trying to go somewhere else but can't are they trying to face it and change it what are they going to be trying to do that's their commitment to action and once you have their commitment to action that becomes the spine of the story the duration of struggle then is their action and the antagonistic force counteraction that's the middle mm. and then at the end the resolution but you might see like in this piece because you do not set up the beginning really yeah that's right. and you have nothing to write in the second paragraph <laughs> that's true yeah yeah you don't have anything to write because he's not doing anything mm. you haven't written the beginning so you can't write the neck you can't write the middle right I mean, it's so it's 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 in its way fascinating and it's not to say that what you haven't what you've written is not it's great it's fine it's a bunch of words on the page you know yeah. you've proved like i've proved many, I can many type. times i can type i can type yeah. yes i can type <laughs> also yeah. but it doesn't go to the level of being the things that we need for the reader which is that level of excitement and engagement mm. in the struggle of another character that is the little tingly thing that we feel as we read through and it's the thing that also makes it so that when we get to the resolution whether it goes badly for that character or positively for that character we get something out of it because we either say oh yes i hope to make that same choice or no i would make a different choice but oh, i uh, see that so so in the first sentence there are three characters so one is the panwala uh, the second is uh, the narrator which is me uh, who is on the page and the third is this uh, this woman who is called as mad woman so there are three characters uh -huh. introduced in the first sentence and yeah, then not, after that true. who's there ram it's not true oh okay what you just said is not a true thing so this is another little little thing that i do but i also don't do it a lot <laughs> of course like all my rules but the, what you have on the page here is you have the panwala and you have uh the narrator this the she is not there oh okay. she's not materially present okay if she is if she is really okay. the antagonistic force if she is the antagonistic mm. force she should be on the page i love this word <laughs> okay that's basically what i love panwala i love that word and i love the gold flake kings I love that too. I love those details, but this Panwala is not central to the conflict. He is not. So, and and the there are two elements to our conflict for our character. There's the external struggle, which is I you know I've said this a lot. It's a material struggle. Right. And then there's the internal struggle, which is the which is the emotional, really the emotional struggle. It's not an intellectual struggle. It's an emotional struggle. What do they want reckon? and what do they need? Yeah. So, but, but going to the material struggle, I mean it, you know, material. I mean, human beings pour gravy over them. It's a concrete struggle. You can pour mm. gravy over the protagonist and you can, the character of the protagonist, not the mind of the protagonist right not the narrator but the actual character with skin in the game he's actually there he can be hurt you know and 
the, the this mad woman, the woman that he's living with. They they should be together. That's your first sentence. <clears throat> um, the thing is, you know, uh, the Panwala and the Gold Flake Kings might be great, but basically you're engaged in a bait and switch then. Right? That's bait and switch. If I'm intrigued with the Panwala and the Gold Flake Kings and think that this is central to the conflict, which I can. Right, yeah. Um, I actually learn very soon that they're not central to the conflict at all, and I feel disappointed. I feel tricked. Okay. But I mean, that's I mean, I'm just saying that's like a little added thing. The real thing is the is the proactive, get the actual, get the actual um, characters who are in conflict, get the actual situation in conflict on the page in a material sense right away. I, you know, at, at the end of the day, I, you know, like, I can't be positive that it's all going to work out if you do everything I'm saying, right? But I'm trying to give us our best shot. I'm trying to of give course. me my best shot, too. I mean, this is the stuff that makes sense to me. Mm. And it's the stuff that that leads me in my writing. I mean, I because I need something to lead me in my writing because I can type like hell. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> Um, Madhavi, you had a question? Yeah, hi. Sorry to disturb at this point, but I had a query. Like, uh, here yeah. you just yeah. uh, mentioned that uh, uh, the Panwala is not actually the central theme, uh, the central character. The lady is right. So, but then uh, my question is that he's kind of introducing this character to us and telling us something about her, his perception or some details about that lady's character. So why is that not enough? You know, maybe it's fine. I mean, maybe she I'm... is not there physically present in the scene, but she's being talked about and we are getting to know her. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think that, that if you think that that's okay, then that, that's great. Go for it. You know, I, I don't want to be. I, I, I sorry, I didn't sound a little crappier than I want to be. But it's like, go for it if you think that that's okay. I'm telling you, my standard is to grab the reader by the throat and get going. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you don't want to do that, if you want to take your chance with introducing a character who's off stage. So yeah, so that's what I wanted to understand. What are the loopholes yeah. like? Take, take your chances, take your chances. Okay. I'm trying to give you the tools to grab the reader by the throat and not let them go. That is the only criteria that we have. Okay, so yeah. if I'm reading because and, and because I believe in this, I mean, I've, I've done this demonstration, it's going to be a loud one. But when I've read for journals, if I'm reading this story, I'm going to tell you the truth. Me, I have I have 100 stories in a stack on my desk a hundred stories. I read this sentence, the Panwala shook his head sympathetically, I might have already been like, uh Oh, trouble. Okay. But let's say that was cut. The Panwala shook his head mad woman, he said, handing back the gold flake kings, right? I read that sentence, I'm in, I am considering this story for publication. Okay. As soon as I find out that the Panwala is not even a character in this story, I take it, and I drop it. That's the truth. I have a hundred stories on my desk. I'm not kidding. I, there, there are editors that they have, they have, I don't know how many people they employ at the New Yorker that read through the slush pile. They have a criteria. They must have a criteria. Do they have exactly my criteria? No. Do they have an openness to being absolutely amazed by something that's that's, you know, taking its time, maybe, you know, or or there are different things, you know, sure. incredible language. The, the Panwala intrigues me, for example, so I'm open to that. But the, I, I just want to be I actually feel sort of passionately about this, this one point, you know, we're writers. So what are we asking for from our readers? We're asking for their lives. I'm not kidding. We are asking for their lives. Maybe it takes me 20 minutes to read your story, but
but you're saying you're saying to me that I'm writing something, I'm writing this story, and and you should give me 20 minutes of your precious life. Your life is only so long, and I'm asking for 20 minutes. I'm asking for an hour. I'm asking for six hours. You're saying that to your reader. I'm going to take your life from you. That's a pretty uh, that's a pretty uh, high bargain. I don't think that we should take it lightly. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I see your point, Otis. So here, essentially, like you said, in the first paragraph, uh, uh, there is an introduction to one person. And after that, it is just a lot of things that are, are those things impacting the story? Actually, I don't think they're, they're impacting. It is a lot of words. I mean, when I well, look back a, at it, it is a lot of words. The, 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 story, words. the, story, the story just basically doesn't start. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 doesn't, yeah, it, it doesn't. The story hasn't decided what it is. Yeah, uh, what true. what is it? Is it a conflict between? Is it a conflict between the woman and this protagonist? Yes, and but it has to be driven by what he's going to do. Yeah. That is what he does. Is the spine of the story? What he does, you know, I'm well. I'm going to ignore her. That's doing something, or I'm going to change her, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be the best, you know, um, lodger that she's ever had and do everything that she wants. And that's going to make everything okay for me, right? But it's going to be driven by that. Yeah. And so now, now, and this is the spine. So the momentum of the story and the character's action is the spine of the story. And then once you develop that momentum, now you can work with the other element that we have, which is to put things in there to create a rhythm. So basically you have momentum and stasis. Momentum, we're going this way to find out what's going to happen next. And then we have elements of stasis that we interject to basically pause the action, but yeah. raise the suspense, to raise the anticipation of the next action. Yeah. That becomes the rhythm. So now we're going and we're stopping, going and stopping, going and stopping. Sometimes we do this by having an A story and a B story, A story right. and a B story. It actually functions the same way, except for that you have two lines of momentum. So it's it's the same structure, but yeah. a little bit even actually a little bit more engaging. This is actually starting with stasis, which is not interesting. Well, it's it's not starting with the principles. It's yeah. I, I mean, it, it is a bait and switch because I automatically think that you are going to start with the conflict. Yeah, that is true. You know, because because that's part of the bargain. The bargain yeah. is the bargain is I'm saying I want to read a story and you're saying here's something that happens. It only happens if there's a something, you know, there's a conflict of some kind that resolves. That means that it happened. Otherwise, it's just stuff. That, otherwise, it's just life. That's not life is not a story. Typing yeah. is not a story. Typing is not a story. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I have a question here um, yeah. uh, regarding the first introduction of the character. Because does it apply to novels as well? Well, you know, if someone if someone comes up to pick up a short story, they're saying that they're going to commit a certain amount of time. If someone's picking up a novel, they're saying that they want to commit a certain amount of time. They understand what they're getting involved with, right? They're picking up something that's this long something that's this long, maybe that maybe it's completely dead time to them, like they're on an airplane and they want to read, you know, there is the airplane novel, that novel that you can read so quickly that you're done with it in six hours or whatever it is, your transatlantic flight. Um, so I don't know. It, I mean, I, you have to make those choices. You know what, it, when I, um, I mean, the novel I'm working on right now, I'm doing my very best to get it up front as quickly as I can. In, in a material sense, I want to get just what I said. I want to get the material struggle on the page, the external conflict and the internal conflict on the page as quickly as I can. And then I want uh, to drive the story with character action. One of our problems, I think, with, as writers, is that we all grew up in an education system in which we were forced to read stuff. Do not think about the things that you were forced to read and try to reproduce things that you were forced to read. Think about 
producing the things that you actually read. Or if you're not reading anything, which is maybe very likely, the, the, the things that you watch, right? Wouldn't it be crazy to think that you're going to write something that you, you write something that's in the style of, you know, a book that you were forced to read and expect anyone's going to read it? Because where's that teacher going to come from that's going to force them? That's a, that's a whole nother level of the system. So you have to write something, basically, this is, this is my proposition. I, I said this a long time ago, but maybe it'll make sense again. You're going back to this idea. You're asking for the reader's life. If you give me something, right, right now, you know, I, I'm, I'm in, in an agreement with you that I'm reading your work to help you work on it, right? But if you if if I'm given something, if I open something in a store or if I find it on a bus, these are these are the readers that you want. They find it on a bus and they open it or something like that. But you're asking for my life. I could go outside. I could go to uh, Disneyland right now. I could go to Small World and I'm a like, God, I have gone there. It's so boring. But anyway, I could go through and listen. It's a small world after all. I could do all of that. I could go. Like I say, the roller coaster, I love mountain biking, I could go mountain biking, I could go and just look at trees, you know, I can do a lot of things, I can go to the movies, I can turn on Netflix, I can watch the Sopranos, which is amazing. You're saying this story instead, it's instead of everything else, I'm in, you are in competition with everything in life. Oh, it makes sense. Uh, recently, I tuned into some movie on Netflix and uh, it was, I think, like about a uh, oh, 140-minute movie. And I started watching it first 10 minutes, 15 minutes. They were still introducing the characters. I switched it off. I, I, can, I can barely find a movie to watch, you know, at this point. So... But it's it's always the same mm. the same issue. So the question about the novel is fine. I mean, you do do what feels right to you and what you have to do, but don't discount what you're asking for from your reader, and and do try and get out of this idea that you know what I was forced to read Great Expectations, and I'm going to write something that's like Great Expectations, which actually. You know, Great Expectations is not a bad model. Um, I, I don't particularly like Great Expectations, but I like Crime and Punishment, for example. Dostoevsky wrote Crime and Punishment as a serial that came out month by month. That means it had to grab the reader by the throat every single time and then go somewhere new and interesting every single time in whatever they were, 10 page increments. That's not a bad model. We better move on, but um, I, you know, the Ram, the, the issue, the issue here, I mean, it, this opening, I think is, I think it's wonderful, like I say, you know, and the writing in general is good, you know, you can type, you can type great sentence sentences, which means that most people are going to say this is, you know, terrific, Ram, keep working on it, you know, um, sometimes our strengths are our weaknesses, we don't have to be good writers to write a great story. We don't even have to write grammatically to write a great story. That is true. We don't need any of those things. We need to have a nose for the conflict, right? For action. And and I don't mean, you know, Bruce Willis jumping out of the building or whatever. Okay. I, any action, even, even avoidance, avoidance is an action, right? Trying to not deal with the problem is an action. Uh, there's a there's a great I think we actually since Bruce Willis can already jump out of the building and the movies do that very very well I think that we should concentrate on the nuances of action that's where we should you know that's where we should put our attention and that's where I put my attention I try to look inside you know these these things and see basically the same story structures which are everywhere it's here in this story it's here with your character but you have to find it and put it on the page. And then you have to focus on that and nothing else. Right? Well, I say that and nothing else, but 
focus on the struggle on the page, but then you want to focus on ba basically what we end up presenting in the story is that rhythm of momentum and 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 uh, and stasis, momentum and stasis that creates anticipation, surprise, etc. Anticipation and surprise. That is the magic of storytelling. And we're going to just do that again and again. It's not rocket science. But we make it rocket science. <laughs> we, we truly make it rocket science. I've but, done but it But writing is not easy. Writing is not easy. Because we have to somehow bludgeon that rocket scientist in each and every one of us and just tell a story. Yeah. Uh, thank you, though. This is, uh, it's, it's, it's good. It's good work. Um, Okay, let's, uh, Rashma. Is Rashma here? Hi. Yeah, hi. Hey, do you want to tell us a little bit about this piece? Yeah, I'm uh, trying to, yeah, that's right. Death, uh, personify death and life as a conflict and eros, of course, because life is also love and sex and everything else. Uh, and then you know, I want to have a negotiation between them where they say, uh, finally we get two human beings, the four hander, two thanatos and eros, which are just, just what are inside of us, but I've kind of uh, used the mythology to put them on as characters, as actors. And then two human beings who want to suicide. And then they have to prove that, and thanatos says, okay, I take one and eros says, okay, I get one. But these two have to prove uh, who deserves to die. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so. OK. Yeah. And, uh, and and so and, you know, we've been working together for a while. So what what do you think? Um, you know, what's what's going to improve this work? Oh, this is I'm just finding the entering a forest right now. It's not. Uh -huh. uh, I have to find my way through it, is uh, what I think. What is going to improve it is, uh, I know I have to kind of build the world because this is not something uh, which happens every single day in every play. So it's not even world building, it's just to put those kind of two people on stage with those kind of costumes and mm -hmm. uh, things. What's going okay. to yeah, uh, I think I need to get my negotiation faster because I hear the, clearly Thanatos, the, um, there's no antagonist, I think, in that sense, because it in my premise, Eros is just as antagonistic in us. So the protagonists are those two people and these, and the conflict between these two is screwing up all human lives. Is, uh, okay. I know. It's so, <laughs> I think I think it's interesting you say that they they personify you know I, I like Eros as sex you know sex slash love and you know that's the life force the regenerative force right and yeah. death is that you know also part of the regenerative force right um, but you say that they personify those things of course people personify them too I mean that's you know so in a this is. Um, kind of, I don't know how to go into this, but basically what I find, what what doesn't draw me into this is that when I'm reading about gods, I'm not reading about me. You know, it's sort of like, I'm not, I can't connect to gods mm -hmm. as easily as I can connect to other human beings. So in this story, I don't really, and, and gods, like, let's say we're, again, we're talking about like, we need to establish a conflict. What's the conflict between gods? Why a conflict Let's just start with the material conflict. Why the material conflict matters. So there's the material conflict and then there's the emotional conflict, the external struggle and the internal struggle. But the external struggle matters because it's a living human being. Basically that the notion they have skin in the game, right? Uh, Rom's uh, character, right? He's got skin in the game. He either gets along with this mad woman that he's living with, he doesn't have any other choices, 
He has to live with her. He lives in this room. She's making all these demands. He feels like he's either going to accommodate those demands or he's going to be out on the street. If he's out on the street, then he's going to be, and I, and I'm, I don't mean out on the street figuratively. I mean out on the street in that he fears being out there where he's going to be sleeping in a curbside. He needs to somehow hold his job. He has no place to shower. You know, he, I mean, the reality, the material reality of what he, fe what he fears, which is a, a, which is a reality that of action that happens to the body. Right. I mean, I, I really, uh, it's taken me so long to get to the point of like, what, what, what is, what are we finally reducing this all to where we, our conflicts and all of these things, it doesn't matter how nuanced they might be. It doesn't matter whether we're trying to please our mom or something like that. We please our mom and it's important to us because we want food. We want shelter. We, we need her protection. This doesn't go away. So the, so the conflict, um, the, the external conflict, finally it gets reduced down to the body. That is potent. Whether we, whether we emphasize it or not, which I always try to think about it, whether we emphasize it or not, it does come to that. But if we're dealing with gods, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But I'm not looking at them as gods. They're just forces within us. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on my, I'm, I'm on my high horse today, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. it's like forces yeah, within no, us, uh -huh. forces within us. But the, the issue is how do we just, we, we have a reader, you know, you have a little bit of a benefit. So yes, you have a benefit right. if you're casting a play because you're going to have actors up there. You're right. going to have actors up there who are going to be physical. But the problem is that you're having them play roles of individuals who are essentially non-physical. I mean, that's uh -huh. what a god ends up being. A god, an immortal god, is a non-physical thing. Uh -huh. even, if they're, even if they're personified, they're, they're basically non-physical because they don't suffer the material reality. Right. Right. If if they did suffer material reality, no matter what they were, even if they were a, a radioactive material, <laughs> you know, they would still have a half life and they would still degrade. They would still degrade. So they're like the only thing that do not degrade. So that means they have no connection with physical reality whatsoever. That means they have absolutely nothing to fear. Mm hmm. Right. How do I how do I identify with that when all I am is a quivering mass of fear? But this, I'm, I'm going to not take more than two minutes to get them up on the stage. And in the third minute, I'm going to have uh, human beings, just two human beings up there, you know. Uh, yeah, okay. We have angels in America, right? <laughs> I, that's Tony Kushner. So after I read that, I thought I need to do one about angels too. And that, that's won all the kind of awards possible. Uh, so he has yeah. angels. So how... How is that angel not a personification? Uh, well, I, angel, I, that's that a play? That's a play and a movie, yeah. Tony Kushner. Yeah. Well, um, I, for one, I don't see plays or movies called angels. But I also, <laughs> you know, so I'm not a perfect person, you know? Right. And it's not to say that you don't have an audience, you know, that wants to read about gods. I, it, I don't end up being that person. I used to say that I would not read read or see any movie that had the word chocolate in it. I mean, I got so sick of chocolate and I am way sick of angels. I, I you know, maybe that makes me a bad person. I don't know. Okay. I, I, I am a selfish, selfish person. I read because I want to connect with characters and I'm not reading because I want to find out what happens to them. I want to have a resonance with their struggle that I can then apply to myself. This is my, unfortunately, it's my very um, questionable altruism. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, I'm just a selfish, selfish person. I right. want to learn so that I can increase my own happiness and chances of survival. Uh, and, that, that's, you know, that, that's fine. Yeah. yeah but, um, okay. If I want to put up a play about suicidal people and 
how do I do it? Just about yeah, so just for the human beings, yeah. People who well, want to die, but only one of them can die because you know there is a place on the boat, let's say. And the life force is going to hold back and the death force can make only one person. So it's, it's actually going to be the conflict between those two people. But, you know, well, they, they're the ones who decide. Then it was an erosion. There's a great, yeah, there's a great movie, um, uh, Lifeboat. Yeah, but yes, you're right. You know, how do you get them into Lifeboat? Um, well, I mean, we... I don't think that we should write it. I think we should try to avoid writing about ideas. Okay. I don't have a good answer for you. I would say, let's use the tools that work, right? Okay. Let's use the tools that work. And I'm basing it only on my very sketchy, you know, writer's psychology slash philosophy or whatever, because mm -hmm. I'm trying to lead myself to save time, right? I'm trying to save time. I'm trying to say, yes, it's fine. I want to write about these things. I want to write about these abstractions. I mean, to me, Thanatos and Eros <clears throat> are abstractions. And I want to write about, you know, suicide, or I want to write about these various things that are abstract. The way I do it is I give up trying to write about those things, and I instead construct a story. Um, I, I create a story structure and then, as I've said, where I don't know where it's going to go. I try to create human beings as best as I can and have them engaged in struggle. I usually focus on one, that's the protagonist, but it doesn't mean that this person is evil, right? They're also an equal person in this struggle. And then I, then basically I chronicle that struggle, which sets up a problem. It has a duration of struggle and it comes to a resolution. And that's the thing, that's the story and I give that story basically to my reader who gets to participate in it by reading the first word. And ideally, they get all the way to the last word. Right. So how do I how do we generate new ideas in the world if we don't go this path at all uh, about new ideas? You know, well, we, we 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 generate them through our observation of the, the human struggle. That's what I think writers do. We don't mm -hmm. generate them first and then write them so we don't come up with them and then say they're true and figure out a way to make it so i i think we we operate as witnesses we try to witness life as well as we can and then find out what we find out we're basically engaged in a in a research project we're not engaged in a you know here i am brilliant and here's my brilliant idea that I'm going to be giving the world and now let me write something that proves that it's true. Uh, so, so we can't dramatize an idea, is, is that what he's saying? Or we, we find the idea in the drama. <clears throat> um, I, it, it, you know, it's just me. You know, there, yeah. there's, there's plenty of people who believe in, you know, dramatizing ideas and writing ideas. I, I think that that's, I, I've come to feel that that is arrogant. Because okay. who the heck are we to write ideas? Who am I? I mean, I'm, I'm so limited. I'm so absolutely limited. Why do I think that I'm going to write an idea? And if I did have an idea and I did write it, why on earth would I want to influence anyone with it? Oh my God, that would be horrible. I would be doing a disservice to humanity because okay. of my great limitations. Instead, what I want to do is I want to try and see the world that's around me and present that. Right. Um, but that, but that's just me. There's plenty of people, you know, your angels, you know, play. If we looked Johnny at it, if we looked at various yeah. things, we can find plenty of people who are writing ideas. Waiting for Godot, we talked about the other day. That's yeah. obviously an idea. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I, I, go to, I go to other things that I think are real, like the idea of point of view, our limitations, our subjectivities are the, the the limits of the limits and struggle of human existence those are the things that interest me and i explore them by exploring character um rom and then and then i present that to the reader because i think that that's what the reader wants to read about i'm and and i totally understand it i mean i don't think that there's a reader out there that's going to say oh my god i wish otis would share with you know with me his his great ideas <laughs> there, there isn't you know, like if I were to do a poll of that, I really I don't think I would get published. 
Right. The, the okay. great the great idea of Otis Hashemeyer. <laughs> you know, everybody has their ideas. That's the thing. Everyone on earth has their ideas. So we actually have to break through all of that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, okay. Rob. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, just a uh, observation. So talking about ideas and uh, depicting abstract concepts, a few years back, there was this brilliant uh, animated movie called Inside Out. So in that, I don't know if any of you have watched it. So that yep. movie essentially was about happiness and sadness. The conflict between happiness and sadness. So the yep. way the uh, uh, the uh, makers of the movie did it is they put happiness and sadness as two little people inside the head of a little girl. Yep. Who are pushing various buttons. And then what happens? So that was, I thought that was a very complex topic, which was depicted in a manner that one could relate to. Um, yeah, I mean, because I have uh, two daughters, I've seen every animated movie, <laughs> you know, basically over these are the movies I see, but right. So that, and then you'll see in that, that you have, you, you have happiness and sadness. They, yeah. they are personified, yeah. right? They are personified within the head of the girl. And so we see the struggle between happiness and sadness and with some other groups to add humor and stuff like that. But yeah. then we see a parallel story. So that's the, we could say that that's the A story. And then the B yeah. story is the girl in her actual life. So we go yeah. from A to B, A to B, A to B. So we're following both. We realize that this struggle between these personified characters, which there is a protagonist, basically, um, the main protagonist is actually happiness, I think. Yeah. In this Joy. Movie. She's called Joy. Who, who must finally realize that, and it goes, wow, oh my goodness, pat myself. It goes in a way that stories go between the protagonist and antagonist <laughs> and moves towards a merger of the two yeah. at the end, Correct. right? Where happiness realizes that um, there is not life with the exclusion of sadness, that sadness is a part of life, just as yeah. happiness is, and they must coexist, right? So, wow, okay, great. And then we also have this life, we realize that there's a bearing and a stake in this struggle in the material life mm -hmm. of the girl. Yeah. Skin in the game. There's actual skin in the game. She yeah. might commit suicide, she might be depressed, she might have to go to therapy, she might, you know, distractedly walk in front of a car, a material issue for her. Yeah. So, yeah, that is so there. We find a way to do what we want to do. But I do not think we find the way to accomplish it successfully unless we take into account what this what the stakes are between us and our reader in reality is basically to understand the reader as a as a human being not as somehow somehow some idealized you know you know uh, expectant uh, sponge who's just waiting for us to bestow them with you know incredible ideas that's not to say rashma that you might not i'm very much like that i really do want to learn from other people so i am a little bit like that and i will see things for that for those reasons but that's that's a little bit of a limitation i when Abhinav comes on i feel like i'm taking too long so <laughs> let me let's move let's move on I, right, thank I you. Just, yes, nothing to say from for me now. Rajma, the, the, but the but the takeaway for me is to when you look at the beginning, you know, I'm I'm really just trying to help you, and I'm trying to help you save time by pre-thinking some of these issues, right? And, and putting them into your head. That's all. So you can say you can write you write about Thanatos and Eros, but say you know what the problem is that readers are not going to identify with these characters. So what do I do to make it happen? If I, I cannot give up these, you know, tried and true Greek, you know, uh, gods, are they new? No. Are they fresh? No. How can I make it work? Or I say, I want to do something new, or I want to do something fresh. That also works, right? But Ezra Pound said, make it new. So there is something to that. So let's understand it. We. we we don't do ourselves any benefit by shying away from the truth of the way human beings are. Okay. I yeah. personally believe that, you know, well, anyway, Abana would be like, oh my God, he's getting into his personal beliefs again. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Let's look at this. Um, 
Thank you. Arva? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. I think this is the first piece that you've uh, submitted? Yes, yes. Oh, great. So this um, is, yeah, so this is the first page of my first completed manuscript. Uh, it's a contemporary romance. And uh, I'll tell you the pitch in short. Uh, so there's an introvert doctor, a charismatic actor, uh, an, un an unlikely friendship fostered under unusual circumstances. Love lurks under the surface. She recognizes it. Does he? So this is the core, the theme of the uh, story. Ah, uh, yeah. That, you know, it's always that issue of like, how do you make him recognize what you've recognized? You know, <laughs> pesky, pesky other people, I always say. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, great. I um, I started this piece and uh, I didn't know how long it was going to be. Um, I I know that I was I was intrigued from the start. You know, from like Rom's piece. You know, it starts here. The monitor beeped. Heart rate eighty six. Blood pressure eighteen. You know, one eighteen over sixty eight. Um, this, uh, I don't know, do you know about uh, being an anesthesiologist? I can barely say that word. I'm a pediatrician myself. So I have, I work in hospitals, so I know how it works. That's why I started okay. it the way. Okay, um, well, that's, I was, I was very intrigued with that. And I think for longer works too, um, that we want to, be operating on a couple of different levels. We want to be operating on the material level of the characters interacting, but we also want to have other things that sort of inform the piece and deepen the piece metaphorically. And I think that the anesthesia, you know, like the idea of being anesthetized, the idea of being put under the places, all of that stuff is very, very interesting to me. Okay, so like, I do think we like reading about people, but we also, um, maybe I should may apologize to Rashma. You know, we also want to have our intellect sort of um, inspired and we want to find new ways. You know, it's not our our idea. This is my thing. But we want to find new ways to express the truth of our life, to see more deeply into it. And I think that this uh, aspect of anesthesia and that work, it's very material. Um, it's there's a lot to be done. It's interesting. It's a world I do not know about. All of those things are good things. So that said, I felt like it started there and then immediately I'm going somewhere else. And so in this short piece, I was like, am I ever coming back to this world of anesthesia that I'm really interested in? Or is this just being put aside now and we're going to go into this other world that's going to just be about these characters? Um, you know, just just dealing with the world of those characters on this trip. But I don't know how I did not know how long it was, but that was my feeling reading the start of it. Did that does that make any sense? I don't know what what you have planned for it. And I don't I also know my writers a little bit because I've taught a lot of writing. We yeah. we we don't always go into the hardest work. You know, and sometimes it is that sort of deep look into some of the metaphorical ramifications of what characters are doing. Um, and we don't always think about how we're going to blend those into the story that we're telling. But I do think it brings our work to another level if we do that work. Um, but uh, uh, congratulations, uh, congratulations on completing the manuscript. So is it novel length? Yes, uh, 50,000 words, but I think if I revise it, I can still increase the word count. Uh-huh. Um, and is it, it's just you're on your first draft? Uh, no, I have done it. I have done one revision, but uh, I think it needs more work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, I'll, I'll tell the story a little bit of uh, the novel I'm working on now. I actually started 
really mm -hmm. almost 20 years ago. And, uh, and I wrote 600 pages of that novel. And, um, and really, I, you know, at that time, I thought it was done, you know, and, uh, but at the same time, I didn't feel like it was exactly right. And I felt so disappointed, I just went on to other projects, which was probably the right decision, I needed to take some time off from it in order to think, and for myself to mature in some ways, so that I could deal with the material. But um, I'm glad that you're, you're taking into account this idea of revision. It's, as I'm finding it now, I've re revised this novel a number of times, and I'm having a really interesting time with my revision this time. But it's, it's building it out. You know, it's getting more deeply into what's happened. It's trying to see more accurately. And so it's really expanding. Well, actually, it was 600 pages. And then I reduced it. I was like, wait, this is a mess. I have all these things in here I don't need. I reduced it down to 200 pages. And now I'm at 100,000 words. So I've taken that one that I reduced here, and now I've built that out like this. It's, um, it's, a, it's a lot of work, but, um, but I'm glad that you're starting to involve yourself with it. Um, let's look at a couple things here. So one of the ways that you might find that you can build out the, build out the work in revision is to just get more deeply into the things that are actually happening and representing them, just show them. So right here this beginning i like this i like this a lot um the monitor beeped heart rate 86 blood pressure etc alicia entered these details in the anesthesia chart now we're going of the patient she was monitoring in the recovery room so we're sort of that sentence has a kind of slowdown where we're kind of catching up the reader with a bunch of stuff so mm -hmm. i would I would suggest instead try to have your sentences and everything that you're developing develop this momentum. And this is going back a little bit to what I said to Ram, but if we understand that the, the shape of our story, whether it's a novel or a short story or anything, is basically this. We want to have a momentum of action that's led by the character. We offer up some stasis that basically arrests that momentum and creates a heightened anticipation for the reader. Whatever we interject should be relevant to the next action, it seems to me. That's my simple way of thinking about it. And you can take that, that basic structure, and if, if you just really embed that in your mind and bring it to your work, and try and straighten out your work so that it does those two things, basically showing this momentum of action, which would be a scene, and then only interjecting when you're interjecting for the purpose of elevating the next action. That is a good uh, place to start a revision. Um, the other thing to think about with a novel is that you, there's really, in, in all of our writing, we have three kinds of information. We have things that are dramatically important we write those in scenes things that are less dramatically important we write those as summary transition between scenes and things that are not important that we omit those are as i see it in my simplified reductive way those are the three kinds of information that we have so if you look at the entire manuscript another way it's sort of simple. It's a, rather than thinking about it, you know, like having to do all this intellectual work and imaginative work, we can just look at it in terms of a formatting issue and say, okay, <clears throat> am I writing a scene or am I writing a transitionary summary to get to the next scene? Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we add to that within the scene right so the transition is a little bit less important it's just information to bridge us to the next thing and sometimes it can be you know it could be 20 years past or it could be some kind of summary something like that mm -hmm. but within the scene we want to think have we brought the character from one place and moved them to another state have we moved them along on their journey because it is going to be an emotional roller coaster that takes us through the work so that means that in each and every scene, we should have the character begin someplace and end someplace new. Um, mm -hmm. 
And you do that. You do that basically in this beginning piece, right? Yeah. You know, she starts sort of oppressed by how much work she's doing. And at the end of it, yeah. she's elated that she's going to go on to a trip, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I noticed this in keeping with some of the other things I said, I, um, we, we have her, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. She's doing her anesthesiology and she's checking on this patient, but I don't really know what she's doing, but I also mm -hmm. don't feel like the, the conflict has really begun. And mm -hmm. so, like I was saying to Ram, it's all, it's always the same process. We want to establish the material conflict, the external conflict, mm -hmm. which basically means getting the two principal protagonist and antagonist onto the page. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as we can, in a novel length work, uh, I think um, Siri Charan uh, asked me about this. In a novel length work, I think it's possible to cover what's, you know, considered, <clears throat> let's say, we might write the first paragraph might introduce the conflict, the second paragraph might introduce why we care, right? And then yeah. at the end of the chapter, at the end of the first chapter, or the end of whatever we consider the beginning, we want the character to be committed to an action. So in a short story, those take place maybe in one paragraph, but in a, but in a novel, it might take place in a chapter, but you want to cover that emotional territory. In this beginning, I don't, I don't feel the story being driven by the character, the protagonist's commitment to action. You're telling me that it's a longer work, so I don't know if I'm going to be seeing that, you know, a little bit later in the chapter. But we want to see the character acting. That's that that is that that is the momentum that we want to create for our book. Oh. Gotcha. So, those are those are my few comments. But um, and you know you'll you'll learn as you go also. So mm -hmm. but but those those little basic those kind of basic things sort of dividing mm -hmm. our attention, understanding that we're writing scenes transitionary summary, scene, transitionary summary, breaking them apart. What I said to Ram, right at the very beginning when I was talking about format, when you're in one section, paragraph everything, right? But don't space them. Space them when you change locations. If you're in the, if you're in the third draft of your novel, right? Right now or the second draft of your novel, spacing things out so that you can look at them individually will be very helpful for you as you go down the line. You know, mm -hmm. I might have eight revisions on my novel at this point, and you mm -hmm. might easily have eight revisions or 10 revisions before it's really done. So you mm -hmm. need to do things that will help you be able to see clearly and focus your attention on one section at a time, not think about the totality, because you know yourself, because you've written it, that that's not really possible. We we cannot our 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 limited brains cannot conceptualize an entire novel. So we have to find systems to look at it piece by piece. And so when we divide it up, scenes and summary, scenes and summary, scenes and summary, then I can look at this scene and say, does this scene work? Yes, no, does it need to be a different scene? Can I rewrite it? Can I save it? Or or you um you, as a doctor, we do triage, right? We do triage on it. This one doesn't need any help. We leave it alone. This one is not going to survive. We cut it out. This one could survive if I help it. We do triage on all our scenes and we do them one by one. Well, great. I better, uh, I better keep moving on. Do you have any questions? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, let's, uh, who, I'm not sure who, who submitted this. Oh, sorry. Uh, Irvi, if I'm saying that right, forgive me. Yes. Hi, how are you? I am great. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, tell us a little bit about this piece. 
uh, i have written it uh, it's a piece of non fiction and i have tried to uh, illustrate the importance of choices in our life okay uh so i don't know if you're if you're following um my my comments so one of the ways i see things is that the the a human being engages a little bit less not to say that we don't we do engage with philosophical comment we engage with abstractions but my argument basically is we engage with it a little bit less than we do with material struggle so like when you say when you say you illustrate um you know this issue of choices in this piece i would say well, it might depend what you mean by illustrate, right? When we illustrate something, we draw a picture, right? Yeah. When we actually illustrate something. Or like Ram was talking about that movie Inside Out, and he was talking about the animation. Well, the animation is illustrating an issue. Illustrate. We're talking about this issue of, you know, these emotions that we, that we kind of think of as separate, which we probably shouldn't. But we think of these separate emotions of happiness and sadness, and the animator is illustrating them with these personified characters who interact with each other and have a conflict with each other, right? And yes. so when I think of illustration, I think of that sort of making something that's abstract. And this is what we're always doing as dramatists. Um, and Rashma, this is this goes back to you know what we were talking about with your play a little bit too but we're always taking things and we're illustrating them with characters and in some way in some form whether it's animation on a play in a theater or in a story my essential argument and anyway it's 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 led my life and it's not to say that people do not write self-help books but yeah. if they do write self-help books they often have, they basically have some kind of idea and then they have supportive evidence, which is um, case studies, right? Yes. They talk about people, they're like, so-and-so, da-da-da-da-da, walked into, now they're using yes. characters in support of an idea, right? In an idea yes. type book. So they have an idea, uh, making positive choices is a good idea. Here's a case study of a, someone who made a negative choice. Here's a case, you know, and they ended up on Skid Row. Here's a person who made a positive choice and they ended up here. So they're still using people, characters to illustrate. And my argument is <clears throat> that's because the reader, because human beings, we identify with other people. Yes, sir. I agree with you because many a times while reading, if there's a story or uh, it is illustrated through a, a people or a person, person's life then it's easier to read and it takes few minutes to read uh, like we don't feel that we have read a, a lot of thing but uh, if it's uh, in a, written in a very uh, mundane type of language very normally just giving the facts it's difficult for reader to read and to complete the uh, article if it's there I yeah. also find it difficult, so I am able to relate to what you are trying to say. <laughs> exactly. Okay, if you can do that, you're way ahead. You're way ahead. So this is exactly, this is how we work. Okay, if we want to understand our reader, all we have to do is understand ourselves. That's all we have to do. And we have to be honest. We have to be honest about it. Do we, do we want... Okay, no matter how good these ideas are, no matter how good they are, and no matter how right you are, would you want to, I mean, basically, you know, someone's telling you all this stuff, no matter what they're telling you, do you want to sit there and have someone tell you a bunch of stuff, you know, give you a lecture about what's right and wrong in the world, and about how, the, how you should behave? I don't know about you, I don't know about everyone, and there's probably someone in this world that does want to be lectured to, but I don't. I don't. That is the trick of stories. Stories convey, convey things, convey aspects of life, and even investigate issues of, let's say, choice, which I think every story, basically, every well-told story 
investigates this idea of choice. I know it's very, very crucial to my own work. And it's not just, I mean, I think, I think you touch upon it a little bit, but like whether we're making choices or whether we're compelled to make those choices, do we actually have a choice in the choices we make? That's the question, right? So we investigate these issues, but, <clears throat> and, and I, I do argue as a, as a writer of stories, when I have characters, I feel, I do not know the answer about whether we, well, I think about it anyway, whether the things that we do are an aspect of choice or whether we're compelled, sometimes compelled by history, destiny, our psychology, our subconscious. But I always try to take the character to a point, right? It's either going to be here at the low point or at the high point where they actually are able to make a choice. I do feel that that's my responsibility to the character. So, but back to this idea of we don't really want to be lectured to. Yeah. We want to identify, this is the trick of story, the, the reader identifies with the character, they perceive the material struggle, they identify with the internal un universal struggle, and then they read it in order to see how it's going to turn out. We never yes. get tired of that. We never get tired of it. And anyway, so that's the large comment. I think it. I think these are tremendously important issues to think about, issues of choice. Yes, yes. And uh, I would encourage you to. I do think of. I do think of our writing as sort of falling into two sides. One is to write stories in which the narrative is the dominant issue, right? And our insights and our ideas, if you want to say, are basically subordinate to the narrative. Or we write idea books, which are, you know, like self-help books or thesis driven books or something like that, let's say about choice. And then we have narratives that are, su in, that are subordinate, but support those ideas. Those are our two choices, either writing about ideas, investigating a thesis of some kind, which might be here, you know, uh, can we make choices? Do choices exist? Let's say that's a thesis. And then um, another one that's driven by narrative and that you should make up, commit to doing one or the other, and that will help you start to formulate what you're doing. Yes, that's true. Yes. I would try I would try and lead you if it were me, I would try to lead you to writing the narratives, you know, write stories about human beings, because as I've as I've said at the end of the day, you know, our ideas, you know, <laughs> our ideas, I don't know what to think about our ideas, but the the the, the dance of life is always interesting and always illuminating to us. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, because I was always confused how to uh, explore an idea, either through narrative or through the normal writings and exploring the idea, like you said, like thesis. And I think the narrative part is really interesting for any reader to read because I am an avid reader and I connect with the characters easily rather than the simple normal writings where they provide with information so i will surely try to add it in my right right absolutely basically write what you love to read D just just do that and you're not going to go that wrong now you might be an unusual person who likes to read things that only a couple other people like to read but then that, that's who your audience is going to be but probably not. You're probably going to be like most human beings. You're going to be interested in reading about other people and interested as I am. I'm interested in both being able to learn from other people's experience, but also being able to experience other people's experience. Yes, sir. Um, OK, thank you. I better um, take a look at the next piece. But if <clears throat> if you do decide to pursue this as an idea, then you want to think about a thesis statement. And I do think of thesis statements when we write idea books or we want to explore ideas. 
we can come up with our thesis basically through this little pattern, which is you think this, you're wrong, it's this. Okay, so that's the kind of what an idea is. So like, you know, yours might be in order to formulate because right now, what you seem to be saying is making positive choices is good. I think we all kind of know that. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's not something that most people would argue with. But if you want to say something, if you want to explore something, you still have to follow the Ezra Pound rule of make it new. Right. So we can't reproduce old ideas. We have to either take old ideas and make them fresh, or we have to present new ideas, right? Those are kind of the two lines of possibility. And probably, well, I, I won't go into that. But anyway, so if we're dealing with a thesis statement, we might say, um, you think um, you have control over the choices you make? You are wrong. <laughs> Our choices are driven by subconscious impulses, right? That could be a thesis. Yes then you could develop it and if you want to write that that's great it's not how i like to spend my time because i like writing sentences that are more fun yes sir sure thank you so much sir because it really cleared me up with what i have to actually write and the yeah. writing process was really simplified i will surely try to inculcate it in my writing yeah i would i'd love to see a prose piece i'd love to see something like that or if you want and and this and this form is fine for you know you know submitting thesis driven pieces too if we do if we if we submit a thesis driven piece i think it's important just like stories that we establish the protagonistic force and the antagonistic force you think choices are uh in your control that's the antagonist the protagonist says they're not they're controlled by your subconscious Two things come into conflict, creates energy. Energy, whether we're writing ideas or we're writing prose, it is energy that we're trying to get. Energy is the thing that excites the reader and that's what they want and that's what drives them to read it. If there's no energy there, then they, then they put it down. Um, yes, but thanks for submitting this piece. Thank you, sir, for uh, giving the feedback.